morning, Fred. Good morning. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? <clears throat> well, I have COVID, so. I'm oh no. Free. But you know, I'll make it through the meeting. Hopefully, you're not feeling too bad. I'll make it through the meeting. <laughs> Understood. So how are you doing? <clears throat> so far, so good today. Have the storms been horrific or? Um, so? Down in Mobile, they weren't too bad. North Alabama got had some pretty bad storms. Selma, I think, had a bunch had several tornadoes. So, but around here, it wasn't bad. Where are you? Well, I live in Pebble Beach. This is my office in the house. Weather good there, or y'all have storms too? <clears throat> well, we have this lineup of uh, storms and um, cyclonic uh, whatevers and uh, rivers. Um, what do they call them? The rivers in the sky, but basically mm -hmm. these, these rainstorms that are like a river of water. So it looks like today or tomorrow, the Monterey Peninsula is going to become the Monterey Island. Oh, goodness. Well, just you can't get in or out by no. vehicle. Mm -hmm. But you can take a boat or a plane. So that won't last that long. Now, where you're at, do you have any issues with mudslides? We don't have a mudslide issue. <clears throat> we have uh, not where my house is. Mm-hmm. Near here, we got plenty of them, uh, but uh, <coughs> it's more about flooding mm -hmm. um, and uh, and wind and uh, but there are mudslides along the highways, so you know. But that's all right. You you can't go anywhere anyway because you're on an yeah, island now. <laughs> yeah, maybe a twenty mile radius, you know. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, Hopefully power stays on, but we have a motor generator in any case. I want to stop talking and reserve okay. my voice here. No problem. Good morning, Michael. Morning, Deborah. How are you this morning? Doing great. Can I go ahead and uh, share my screen, make sure this works? Sure. Just very quickly. Yep. Okay, looks good. All right. Got a busy day today. It's been a real busy week. Uh, this is the last presentation of the week, though. So well, that's good. This is the third one, I think. So, um, but I'm I'm glad you asked me to do it because it it demonstrated to me that uh, we really need a deck like this internally, mm -hmm. and um, this one is not where it needs to be, but it will help us get there. So, place to start. Yeah, uh, we have a new licensing associate after Andrew's death right. has come in, uh, Chris Kozar. And uh, one of the things we've talked to him about are kind of doing lunch and learns across campus. So uh, I talked to him yesterday, told him what I was doing. And so I intend to turn this over to him and then he's going to make it beautiful. <laughs> well, good. Lisa, yeah. yeah. More will come of this, so that's great. Yeah. And you have to the chamber after this. Is that what you said? What you said? Well, let's see. I don't think I just had one meeting that canceled this morning oh, okay. at the last minute. Um, it looks like I have a little free time, so oh, I have meeting, meetings this afternoon. But I was supposed to be going downtown.
How many people do you expect on the call? Um, we, we had 15 yesterday, including our panelists. So we had about um, six um, that were signed up for the workshop. We had 13 signed up for the workshop and six logged in yesterday, but um, a lot of them were in the path of the storm. So I don't know if the bad weather, we had a lot from <clears throat> North Georgia and North Alabama and um, North Mississippi. So I'm not sure if the, some of those will come in today or not. Yeah, I, I wasn't, so. until I watched the news last night, I didn't realize Selma got hit, but a few people died, apparently. Yeah, Selma got hit pretty bad. So. Well, I take it this is pretty informal. Yes. Okay. And we'll start about eight o'clock, so. Okay. You can judge the informality by my attire. <laughs> what tire? Attire. <laughs> you mean, oh, I have a spare tire too, but that's just I'm working on one of those too. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Chris. How are you this morning? I don't know. The, the autopsy will show. <laughs> Chris, did you see my response yesterday in the chat box to your question? Um, I have to say that I do not recall. Uh, there were a lot of responses all mixed up and... Uh, uh, no worries. So the... You were talking about intellectual property, I believe? Uh, no. Uh, well, it was related, but the idea, as far as I know, uh, is that when you are asking for money from investors, they have to have an idea about what it is that they're buying. And so you have to disclose uh, sometimes critical information about the operation. And unless you have a way to show that what you're doing is protected, the IP is protected, then they will say, okay, why should I go and put money on you when, you know, now the idea is out in the open and someone else can come and do it themselves. It has happened to me before. There was, uh, from time to time, there were cases where people who wanted to start up something, they would go to universities and start looking for talent. They would offer uh, part of the action for it, which creates another slew of problems if you already have another job. Um, and... Uh, there were cases where when they would describe to me what it is that they want to do, um, I would ask, well, so how do you know that another kid is not going to come the next day and do what you're doing, exactly what you're doing, but better or more efficiently? And so it, yeah. it doesn't matter you know, if it's a little bit better or more efficient. It might be worse, but it's still a competitor. <clears throat> Well, like I said, that 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 is a question that I was wondering how it is handled. Of course, there is no uh, one shoe size fits all. Every case is different, and every place is different. You know, I'm 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 wondering uh, all of the people that were talking yesterday, talking about some success that they have and everything. The question in my mind was, you know, if you were not where you are and you were at another place, would you have had the same success? Yeah. So I'll tell you the answer is probably no. Um, yeah. so, so recognize that the selection of attendees, <clears throat> the selection of speakers is based on their incredible success. Right. And you don't hear about from, from, from others 
who have tried similar uh, ventures? Well, well, well I, I do, and, and I promise if you ask me, I will tell you about um, nine times as many failures as successes at least. Right, yeah, and I've, I've heard that story before. Then uh, another issue is uh, the university matters too, because obviously we're talking about people who are at universities and how uh, technology transfer works there. Many universities are pushing for it and some other universities have no idea about it. Uh, in the place where I am, um, we have mandatory senior projects in some programs. And some of these senior projects from time to time happen to be actually pretty good. And I developed the idea at one point that maybe instead of doing something that just demonstrates the ability that the student has and fulfill course requirements, encourage them to do this and try to at least mock bringing it to market so that they would get some experience with this. And I did have some pretty good experiences myself. I took students to startup competitions and they learned things that they've never heard before. So there was this three day competition that uh, startup competition that, uh, that was organized by another university. I took a team of students there and we were, just doing engineers, at least the business people, that's what they called it. They say, well, you gotta speak engineers, but how about customer validation? How about the value proposition? I say, what? <laughs> What's you talking about? So they learned a lot of stuff. And, and then it uh, occurred to me that this should be something that should be interjected in the senior projects and everything. But I didn't find that there was enough support or interest uh, to do that. And my idea was that, you know what, if out of a hundred, two of them managed to actually take this seriously and try to bring something to market and they were successful, then these people would hire all the rest. <laughs> So there you have the economic development um, aspirations that almost every university has and all of that. But um, then I tried to involve business school into this and try to see if I could pair uh, students in computer science or computer engineering with uh, students from the business school and so while the students are doing their projects, another component of it would be to work with the business students to try to mock how they would go about bringing this to market. But um, this required extra work that you know, other people weren't willing to put in. And there was no enticement for that other than you know, the aspirations. Let's try this, let's see what happens. And then there is also the uh, question, okay, so what would be the carrot on this? Why would someone do it? What would they get out of it other than a pat on the back? And the answer there is kind of muddy because there is all this, all this uh, labyrinth of, uh, and, and red tape of, uh, uh, IP regulations or IP policies and what is the role of the faculty and you know the faculty cannot participate into anything that comes out of this and some places do allow that some places don't allow that so it's just not a one uh, one uh, shoe size fits all it, it's just it's just so variable so you can do something in one place it's not easy to do it in another place that's basically it
Well, good morning, everyone. I hope um, everyone's having a good day. Um, we're going to wait just a minute um, for a few more people to log on. Um, Alec, did you see my text message? I need you to, um, we have some people logged into yesterday's Zoom meeting, so um, I need to get that corrected and get um, them on to today. So we'll start in just a minute. Uh, when do you expect uh, that the video would be processed to share? I anticipate that being sometime. Uh, yesterday's sessions should be sometime this morning. Um, and then this morning's workshop should be in the afternoon. Okay. <laughs> Trevor, do you have what you need there? Yes, I do. Okay. Oh. Okay. So again, we want to welcome everyone back um, this morning to um, our second day of our workshop. Um, I think we had some great um, discussions yesterday. Um, first thing we did yesterday was introduce ourselves. We have a couple of new people on this morning. So um, Michael Chambers can introduce himself in just a minute. He's our first speaker this morning. Um, we also have Elise McGowan. Elise, you wanna tell us, you wanna um, introduce yourself, just tell us where you're from and your interest in TTP. Uh, yes. Good morning. My name is Elise McGowan. I'm a recent grad from the University of South Alabama, and I'm currently at the University of Southern Mississippi uh, as a visiting assistant professor. And so I'm just interested in learning more as I begin my journey. That's great. And as I, as she said, she's a recent um, one of our um, first, not first, but in our first few years of our PhD program. So we're proud to have um, her back um, on the call and working um, at Southern Miss. Um, Alec, do you have anything you want to say to start the morning off? Uh, I think I'm uh, good to go, uh, Deborah. I'm, I, I too thought the sessions yesterday went uh, fantastic. Uh, I thought that panel was uh, run extremely well. G he and that the group came in well, they were really well prepared and and uh, hit many of the issues that we need to hit. Uh, I mean, really a lot of good discussion came out. Uh, I'm looking forward to the, the panel this morning, and uh, I, I am just so glad to connect with everybody again and see all my old friends or many of my old friends and 
and uh, looking forward to a good day today. Thank you very much. Okay, well, um, yesterday um, we had some great discussions that went a little over, so I'm not going to blab on for another seven minutes just to get us on schedule. So I'll go ahead and turn um, the morning session over to uh, Michael Chambers, who's going to talk about um, working with university research offices. Michael? All right, first, uh, just a quick sound check. Can everybody, Deborah, can you hear me fine? Okay, great. Uh, I'm Michael Chambers. I have the uh, pleasure of serving as the Associate Vice President of Research and Economic Development uh, here at the University of South Alabama. And thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to speak this morning. Uh, I know Dr. Yassin Sack because he uh, created, launched, founded kind of our participation in a IUCRC here focused on digital forensics. And I was uh, uh, honored to be able to work with him on that. And I know Dr. Chapman through our work here with i -Corp. I'm the site director here, and Deborah has been a tireless contributor to uh, i -Corp. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. So if you have any questions, I hope when I pull up my deck here that I can see your questions in the chat, but it's a small group. So just shout out questions. I might cover something later in the presentation. And if so, I'll, I'll let you know at the time. Uh, but uh, uh, pretty informal here, so uh, don't don't hesitate. There's no doubt in my mind uh, that there are plenty of people on this call, if not all of you, that know more than I do. So uh, I'm not here to speak as an expert. I'm really here to talk about my scar tissue uh, in dealing with tech transfer offices. Uh, I come to you kind of having been on both sides of the fence, uh, being uh, an entrepreneur before I came here to the university about seven years ago, founding a couple of companies, mostly in, in life sciences. So I've dealt with tech transfer offices uh, from Johns Hopkins on the East Coast to uh, USC on the West Coast and some people in between. And I will tell you, I've had good experiences with some and uh, at least in one case, a very bad experience. And I can, uh, can't can tell you who that was with, but I can certainly share kind of some of the issues. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about intellectual property. I am a lawyer as well as a PhD, but I am not a patent lawyer. So uh, again, uh, I'm going to tell you my experience, but if you have any deep patent issues specific, you know, you should consult either your tech transfer office where you might have a patent attorney or an agent uh, or an actual, uh, you know, outside private uh, counsel. All right. So let me uh, try to share my screen here. All right, so I've kind of told you uh, who I am and where I've been in terms of working with some uh, different companies. Uh, and I, Chris, I think, had some questions early on about essentially exits. Uh, I've uh, navigated one of those when I was in the private sector as the um, founder and CEO. So I just wanted to kind of start to set the uh, stage a little bit because I find this particularly relevant. One of the challenges that we all face, whether it's just in this area, is really uh, the change, but also the speed of change. And just to kind of uh, go broad for a second here, if you look back uh, in terms of just aviation, we've gone from Wilbur Wright in the early 1900s to here in Mobile, we build five or six a330s every single month, and now we're the fourth largest manufacturer of commercial aircraft in the world here in Mobile. In aerospace, we went from just uh, you know putting men into orbit in the late 50s, early 60s, landing a man on the moon in 69, and now we have the the Webb satellite sending us pictures of planets I saw last night that we've never seen before. Lifespan. Uh, when Wilbur Wright died in 1912 at the age of 45, the average age for a U.S. Uh, male was 48 years old. Today, it's pandemic adjusted somewhere in the neighborhood of 76 to 77 years old. So the lifespan just within 100 years has changed dramatically. And uh, if you're a fan of David Sinclair, who's at the uh, Harvard Center for Longevity, 
they've identified four critical factors that extend lifespan, at least in rats. And there are many scientists predicting that people born today will easily live to 120 if they live right. Medicine, same way, incredible uh, speed and change. We uh, essentially were able to map the human genome in the early 2000s at a cost of about a billion dollars. Today, you can do it for yourself for less than a thousand dollars. If you're familiar with some of the Walter Isaacson books, one of my favorites recently is called The Code Breakers. It's a story of the journey of coming up with something called CRISPR-Cas9, which is certainly outside computing, but it's kind of the tool that's used to edit gene mutations. And that in itself was a critical component of all the vaccine development that we benefited from recently. Within the last century, 14 vaccines uh, have been, uh, 14 critical vaccines were just developed by one person, Maurice Berenson. Uh, so if you look at that, the causes of death in the United States in the early 1900s, there were four. Uh, today, they only represent less than 10%. So many of the major causes of death have been eliminated. Computing, I won't even go there. You know that topic better than I do of what's changed. Uh, you know, the, the field was born, depending on how you look at it, but has just seen incredible growth, speed. Uh, and that's really something to consider because things are happening so quickly. I really only found out about chat AI GPT probably 30 to 45 days ago. Uh, I attended a meeting three days ago with 40 faculty who just came at the last minute uh, because they're all concerned about whether students will be writing essays using chat AI, for example, you know, and how do you prevent that or how do you use it? So that's just a little background. The point here is things uh, in the market, in the marketplace are changing and technology is changing at a speed that we've never seen before. So the consequences, I think, is that in a sense, we have to work faster, work smarter. We have to know the market. Uh, and if you are trying to transition something into practice to commercialization, you really have to deliver what the customers want, what the market needs. So I pulled this page uh, really from our tech transfer office because I thought it was a pretty good place to launch from. Uh, in any of the universities that you come from or that you deal with should have a page similar to this, uh, introducing themselves. And if, uh, Deborah, can you see my pointer here in the lower left? Okay. Yes. So, here we're going to talk a little bit in a second about invention disclosures. That's something that tech transfer offices, if you have an idea, you think it might be patentable. Uh, the process typically is that uh, you submit an invention disclosure. I would encourage all of you to call them before you do that, set up a meeting, talk about what you have before you go to the trouble of doing that. Uh, commercialization roadmap, I'll show you an example. And then search technologies. And you might ask, well, well, why is that there? So tech transfer is kind of a, uh, you know, it's a gatekeeper. It's there for you to open the door to get help uh, on your particular invention or your idea. Uh, but it's also there as a portal for everybody on the outside to look inside and see what kind of technologies are available. So if you had one and an invention disclosure was submitted, patent process took place, your technology might be listed in that portal to be able to attract industry partners who might be looking for something like that. Um, and you see up here in the core research competencies, many tech transfer offices like ours will publish, you know, here's what we're good at. Here are the things that we do. So if you have a particular expertise uh, uh, that you would like to offer to the private sector, that's something else that you could contact uh, tech transfer about and make sure that your core competency, your expertise is listed. Now, this area here called resources is the critical one because I'm going to, if you look at ours, if you clicked on that link, uh, here's what you would see. And it's kind of intended to be uh, a one-stop shop um, tech transfer. And here are the links that you would see on ours. Available seminars, and that's the thing to remember. There may be things that 
go through a lot of what we will talk about today, some of the steps in the process. If you look at our frequently asked questions uh, link, it will talk about patentability, invention disclosures, copyrights, take you through a lot of the key terms, you know, what the process looks like. Uh, for entrepreneurs, it would talk about some of the resources that might be available either internally at your university or externally. I think I heard Chris uh, talking about pitch competitions, which are a valuable way not only to get practice pitching, but uh, as he mentioned, uh, learn what you don't know sometimes too from students participating. Uh, we do a lot of life sciences and material transfer agreements really addresses that. Uh, student research agreements we'll talk about in, in just a few minutes. The reason that's critical is because depending on your intellectual property policy at the university you deal with, uh, students are treated differently. Uh, grad students working for you, uh, being paid um, under a grant, uh, then that intellectual property in most situations is still going to be owned by the university. On the other hand, undergraduates just taking a course, not paid, uh, if they come up with something, it may belong to them uh, as opposed to you jointly or the university. Again, that depends on your university intellectual property policy. But one of the ways we finesse that is when we get in those circumstances, we have students sign a particular agreement saying, OK, I'm letting you work on this, but here's the deal. The other great thing is we'll talk a little bit about pot conflicts of interest in a minute, but this is a good portal where you can go and see conflict of interest, the intellectual property policy, how the money is divvied up, if there is a royalty stream, and then last, uh, a commercialization roadmap. So the purpose of this slide is to show you if you go to the tech transfer website, uh, in most cases, not all, but hopefully there's something just like this that will lead you in the right direction. So how can tech transfer help you? Well, it's a good place to start to see you know, is my idea, is this technology patentable? Uh, and everyone realizes that in the computing space and software space, there are particular challenges to protecting with a patent. It's not impossible, but the great thing about a patent is if you get it, uh, it gives you exclusivity in whatever that patent covers. Copyrights are also a possible uh, way to protect uh, what you have. And then know-how, I was in a meeting yesterday with uh, some faculty members here. We really don't think that uh, patents may, may be the right way to go because there's so much kind of internal knowledge of knowing how to do something, you know, how it all fits together. And the most famous example of kind of know-how, a company that has chosen not to do a patent, which would be limited to 20 years, is to basically treat that know-how as a trade secret and guard it with your life and protect it through non-disclosure agreements, confidentiality agreements. And that example is Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola never patented their formula or their recipe, but they guard that secret as know-how or a trade secret. So because of those three things, tech transfer is very valuable in helping you develop potential barriers to entry. And that's kind of the technical term of what keeps other people from doing exactly what you've done. The other thing that they can help out on, and uh, this is where uh, the relationship changes a little bit with tech transfer, because when you come to them, they're making an assessment of, is there any potential to this project? Because this is university, in most cases, university-owned technology, and they're trying to figure out do we want to in, invest in this? Because they may be pay, paying all the patent expenses, you know, for a non-provisional, it's probably five to $10,000 for a non-provisional patent application. It could be uh, 20 to 30,000. It's not unusual. So it's no small investment. But what they do many times is they uh, engage a third party through a non-disclosure agreement that has experience in this area, and they will do a commercial assessment and determine uh, you know, this, the, the next really line, they will look at the market for your idea, the size of the market, and particularly look at the competition and look at people who might be interested uh, in acquiring or buying or licensing your particular technology. And then finally, uh, the, the tech transfer office can give you 
great information about industry contacts, people who might be interested in the technology. So the specific help area, specific help areas, general advice, um, and one example of that is uh, kind of lunch and learns. On many campuses, the Tech Transfer Office will sponsor uh, within your department or your college kind of lunch and learns about patents, about the process. Uh, they have form invention disclosures that they typically use. And, uh, you know, universities aren't known for their speed in processing documents. So my approach on the private sector side was uh, when I was dealing with the university, I'm not even going to send you my form. Send me your form, the university form that everybody's blessed. It's been used for 10 years uh, and it'll speed up the process. Uh, Non-disclosure or confidential disclosure agreements, uh, they have those as well, which I just mentioned. And then their license templates. And the one thing is, as an individual dealing with tech transfer, that you have to realize is that they have an institutional history of how they've crafted licenses, the language, and then they've probably kind of pegged terms. Uh, you know, if it's this kind of technology, we think this royalty percentage should apply. And that may be different from uh, for research tools or for drugs or for software. Uh, that kind of changes. And so having a meeting with them asking, how do you treat this? How do you deal with this? What's the typical structure? Uh, what's the percentage royalty? What do the milestones look like? And, you know, milestones are, uh, if you're not familiar with those, if you license to someone, uh, you want to make sure they do something with it within a particular period of time. You don't want them to just sit on it. And so the milestone aspect of a license agreement says, okay, you've got to do this by a certain time. You have to maybe uh, file with the FDA or you have to sell X number of units by a certain time. Uh, and if you don't, then that technology comes back to the university and you can license it to someone else. Another help area that we've mentioned is the programming aspect. And then finally, funding sources. And these are funding sources uh, locally. It could be through uh, incubators or accelerators. It could be, uh, be through state programs. Uh, we just launched, I'm a part of an effort launching uh, SBIR and STTR matching funding in Alabama. That exists in about 20 states. So if you did file um, uh, either one of those and received an SBIR, or STTR, in many states, you have the option then to take that decision letter, file a new application with your state, and get either matching or up to a certain percentage of funds on top of that to either advance your startup or from the tech transfer office you, uh, and the STTR aspect to move that project along between a small business and the university. So anytime anybody has a question, just jump in. Um, <clears throat> this is kind of what it looks like here at South. You know, you make a discovery, submit an invention report. Uh, then they have an inventors meeting, which as I mentioned, is a really good idea. Uh, and then you can see it goes through Invention report, discussing, potentially uh, filing a provisional uh, or not. Uh, and then you go through the process all the way up to uh, publishing or presenting the discovery. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of disclosures and publications in a second. Uh, this is not my favorite slide, but uh, you, it kind of explains the same thing from the start invention disclosure. And then there's that market analysis, because um, I, I haven't had this experience with uh, uh, the School of Computing, but I do have this experience with scientists from the life sciences sector. Every molecule that they come up with is worth a billion dollars. Um, that's kind of the first reaction. Uh, and that market analysis is very important because it's not just what the market size is, it's how long it takes you to to get to commercialization, you know, how fast can you make money? And uh, so it's identifying the, the need and the path to market, which you see, and then sometimes de-risking the technology. If there's some things that, that need to be done, added on uh, to your original idea to make it more valuable and more capable of being protected. So this may vary from um, institution to institution, but you can see the different, it's here to show you kind of some of the different stages. And I will just kind of draw your attention, we'll talk about this in a second, to the upper right. Um, 
when you're dealing with a third party <clears throat> on the license point of view, the tech transfers tech transfer office is thinking, okay, this is a great a great invention, uh, and it has applications in three or four different areas, and so you have potential interested parties with differing opinions. One may come in and say, we want it all. We're going to develop this technology for all different types of fields of use. But then you may have another company that comes in and says, well, you know, we only do A and we're not interested in B, C, and D. And so from the tech transfer point of view and your interest as an inventor, you kind of have to weigh things. Obviously, if there's a Pfizer that comes in is willing to pay from a life science context for everything, that's a good thing. But in many cases, it gets piecemealed, like somebody, somebody might, may want it for A, B, C, or D. And from your individual point of view as an inventor, that's not necessarily a bad thing because you have four, four different people working to use your particular invention in fields of use. So uh, that's uh, a little bit how that applies. All right. Uh, this is uh, how the University of South Alabama does it. And it, it's here. I'm on mute. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, it's just an email exchange, but it sounds like it was pretty fun. That, um... I'm sorry, somebody asking a question? No, I think someone thought they were muted, but they weren't, oh. but I muted them. So you're good to oh, go. Okay, all right, not a problem. Um, so this is kind of the way it happens at South Alabama. And, the, and you can see here on the left, it depends on how much money comes in. So if just a little comes in, whoops. If uh, just a little comes in, then it's most of the money goes to the inventors. If more comes in, then more goes to the university. And if a lot comes in, it's more of an even split, but the inventors still take the, uh, the highest percentage. Uh, and I will kind of point up here, this USA FRC is a university research foundation. It's an affiliated institution. And you may have, this is based on uh, WARF. If you're familiar with the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, that's kind of the mothership of all research foundations. And so the royalty stream here at South and there as well, as royalty streams come in, a percentage is cut off the top, and that funds a foundation that delivers money back to faculty for uh, research, for training, development, et cetera. So WARF, just to give you an idea, uh, they have, they deliver on an annual basis uh, over $150 million uh, every year because of the growth of their foundation. And uh, you'll see that a lot. So if your university has a research foundation, you might check with them to see if there's money available for grants and research. And so that's why I bring that up. Um, ownership of intellectual property. These are probably things that you know already, but typically if you work for a university, you're an employee and you uh, are subject to the rules and policies of the institution. You sign a document that says, you're bound by the faculty handbook or the university policies. And so that's where you kind of get into this issue of you're an inventor, you came up with the idea, but if you refer back to these policies, most institutions will tell you, you are the inventor, but you are not the owner by virtue of the university paying you to do this work and giving you the opportunity and the facilities to create uh, this invention. The university in fact is the owner and it's, uh, you know, what you get uh, and your method of operation is governed by the handbook and any policies that apply. So from your point of view, if you're trying to figure out, well, what does my institution say about any of this? There are a couple of critical documents you want to look at. You know, take a look at the faculty handbook. Uh, there may be a specific university policy on intellectual property, and that's typical because they tend to change. Uh, you may have a signed employment contract, which is critical to look at, not only um, from the intellectual property point of view, but taking a look at it to see uh, how flexible the university is in allowing you to work one day a month, three days a month as a consultant or whatever. Because if you do a startup, 
Uh, that clause is very important because you could go right to the limit of that, but probably no further in your involvement. So that's something to look at. Um, and then if you're spending a lot of time uh, either in a startup or uh, working with tech transfer on the patent office, you want to make sure you take a look at your promote. If you don't have tenure yet, you want to take a look at your promotion and tenure known as P&T policy uh, to make sure that you're going to get credit for what you're doing. And I would encourage you, if you are junior uh, junior faculty, not yet tenured, to take a look at not just the overall university policy, but what I've learned is they're either written and unwritten p and policies, not just by college but or school, but sometimes by department. So uh, go to your department chair and say, you know, this is what I'm going to be spending a lot of time on. And I want to make sure that, you know, if I get a patent or if technology is licensed, that, you know, that's respected just as much as a publication in a peer reviewed journal or more. Uh, so that's a conversation you may want to have early on. So here's an example. We talked a little bit about student inventions um, earlier. And uh, Deborah, if you just kind of keep me on track for time, make sure that let me know when I got about five minutes left. So you look at the university policy. Uh, this basically said, if you're a student, these things are going to be subject to the university IP policy, meaning the uh, university will own them. So if you're conducting research uh, as part of a post-baccalaureate or postdoctoral degree or non-degree program, or work directly related to the student's employment or research responsibilities at the university, or you're working under a grant, it's university owned. And this is, uh, a lot of this kind of grew out of the Zuckerberg example with Facebook. If you remember, uh, he came up with Facebook by spending 48 hours straight in Harvard's computer lab. Uh, you know, clearly used a lot of their facilities and resources. And though Harvard had an argument probably that they should be the owner of what he came up with by virtue of using those facilities, uh, they probably wisely said the better course would be to uh, hit him up for a big contribution later on. So here are a couple of examples of different paths if you're an inventor uh, of what you can do. You can license to a third party. This would be handled by tech transfer. Uh, they should or would uh, consult with you on, on the scope and the milestones, but not always, and the royalty stream. And in this scenario, the challenge to you is just how much am I going to be involved with this third party? In many cases, they may want to say, well, Chris, you know, he he really knows his stuff. We want to we want to hire him as a consultant. We don't want to have any issues with your conflict of interest policy, but we need him. We can't just transition this without him. And uh, so that's something that you want to be aware of. Uh, you know, what are you going to do and how are conflict issues handled? The other path is uh, uh, much more difficult, I will tell you. The great thing about a third party is you turn it over to the tech transfer office and then they handle it. Uh, when it's startup, this means that you go to the tech transfer office and say, I want to do this. I'm going to start my own company. I'm going to raise money. I'm going to hire people. So I want to license this agreement. Uh, from the university. So what you should expect in those situations uh, is a little bit, the relationship changes, you're negotiating with them at that point, and they're saying, wow, gee, uh, Elise, we love you, but you know, you just graduated from South, you're a brand new assistant professor at USM, and um, we, uh, you know, we, we just think the, the agreement ought to be a little tighter until you prove yourself. And so the scope or the field of use might be very narrow. The milestones might be tighter. Uh, the royalty stream might be higher. Uh, and then there's the issue of patent expenses. Uh, many times a startup would love for the university to pay the patent expenses. And many times they have to because the startup doesn't have any money. But that financial relationship can affect these other clauses. It can make the royalty stream higher, can make the milestones tighter. Uh, so they're related. Um, and where the conflict issue really hits the road is here, because if you're in the startup, your university is going to be watching very closely or your department chair or whoever, uh, how involved are you? Are you really respecting the conflict issues? Um, you know, and if you're getting founder's equity in some institutions, I think ours is an example of that you can't have it both ways. 
So you may be asked to waive your royalty stream because you've got all the founder's equity in the startup. So that's another issue to discuss with your tech transfer office. So, um, you know, we're all talking, the whole mission of this presentation is talking about how to transition to practice, commercialize, uh, uh, not necessarily monetize, but transition to practice. And I think the thing to remember here that NSF would tell you is uh, their focus is on improving life, well-being uh, in the United States and pushing technologies forward. Their mission is not to finance your research career. So the prospect of you simply working on something for two years, publishing a paper, and then moving on to the next grant, that's no return on investment to uh, the National Science Foundation. So they are looking for uh, broader impacts and big ideas. Uh, from your point of view, your motivations obviously could be, um, you know, that same mission helping in, uh, the broader impacts, but it's, you know, justifiably related to promotion and tenure. And uh, being interested in money, from my experience, is not a bad thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a great incentive. So I'm kind of transitioning now. It gets a little corny at this point, so I apologize. It's early in the morning. We're trying to wake everybody up. So um, here are a couple things. So Professor Smith has learned that some business training might be available through a program on campus called i -Corps. So this is me shamelessly promoting a, a program that I'm involved in, but it nonetheless applies here. And he wonders why it would be a good idea. So uh, if you don't know about i -Corps, again, this kind of relates to something that Chris was talking about before we got started. Uh, it's in 100 campuses or more throughout the United States. Typically, it can be either a two-week rocket course or like eight weeks as we have here, credit or non-credit. Um, and it's based on customer discovery. What does that mean? Well, it means that you kind of take the, the kernel of the idea, not necessarily the secret sauce, but go out and do 20 to 30 customer interviews, interviewing them, not saying, will you buy this, but saying, are you interested? Uh, you know, tell me about your problems in this area. What keeps you up at night? And you're trying to figure out what they really need and then work your way around to coming close to your idea. Works with student teams, uh, you know, faculty can participate uh, and you can bring in outside folks as well. Here at South, we give uh, each team $5,000 that can go towards travel to conferences where they can interview folks. If you participate, you can go on the trip too. Uh, you just have to check with your institution to see how much money they can give you. Here, I give them uh, an Innovation Scholar Certificate after they completed the course. Now, what's another reason to do this? Well, not only do you do those 20 or 30 interviews, which helps you kind of sharpen where, you know, what the customers really want and see if your idea has legs, but you may also qualify for the national program. If you qualify for the national program and do well enough in the uh, local program, you're entitled to a $50,000 grant, and that $50,000 can go to travel, prototypes, but here's uh, something of interest. It can also pay for a grad student to do those things for you, to do the travel, to work on the prototype. So it's uh, really not a bad deal at all. Michael, and you have about five minutes left. Perfect. All right. This is what uh, I think Chris mentioned earlier. So what we focus on are customer segments uh, here and value proposition. Who are we gonna sell it to and what benefit will those customers get? And it's lining those up to let you know what you should be doing. Uh, here's a quick one. So here's the problem I outlined before. You know, there's a little change of institution uh, and then there's an undergraduate student, unpaid, who works on the technology. Uh, and the problem there is you may not own it. The university may not own it. The student uh, actually may own it. And that's kind of the nightmare scenario, right? Here's another one. Technology may be patentable, but published, and it uh, really describes the key elements. and thinks he's got a year to file, uh, are there any issues? Well, technically speak, speaking, there still is uh, one year, but not everywhere. So you immediately might waive your rights once you publish. In the UK, Canada, um, uh, and in some, well, let's say 
in the UK and other places, you have like six months. So that's a trap. So be aware of that. Here's one of my favorite ones. Um, get rich fast. Bub and Buffy, new students, forms a startup, licenses them, negotiates a 10% royalty, and 80% equity is non-dilutable. Your tech transfer office would have told you if you strike that deal, no one in the world will ever deal with you because uh, probably there's never going to be a 10% royalty. And there's no way that anyone will invest in a company with 80% of the uh, capital already locked up with non-dilution. So an example of making sure you don't do things in advance that really spoil the, spoil the punch. And I think this is the last one. Um, Professor Smith, graduate student, decides to give the grad student 50%. Grad student leaves, goes to another institution working for arch nemesis. So Professor Smith is really upset, decides to cancel all the stock. This is the one I give to people because I say that um, love can be fleeting, but equity is forever. So be careful who you give stock to because once it's done, there's no going back. Uh, all right, so biggest mistakes, failure to manage the overall invention, disclosing inadvertently, uh, making commitments, thinking you can sign non-disclosures or license agreements when you really have no authority. And the biggest issue of all is just not contacting tech transfer at the beginning. So uh, that's the end. I'm happy to uh, uh, answer any questions. And when you come to Mobile, this is uh, where Dr. Chapman and Dr. Yasin Sack are located. Um, and that's what's very nearby. So we hope that you'll come visit. Any questions? Michael, I think Vaughn has a question. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah Michael, thank you for this, this overview of, of your office's efforts. I'm curious, you mentioned NSF a number of times in there. And from my point of view, commercialization offices and NSFs have very similar motivations in this regard, You know, broader impact versus the commercialization. How well, from your perspective, do you think those incentives are aligned? And is there friction or is it all harmony? Between NSF and a tech transfer office? Yeah, or federal funding agencies in general, however you'd like to cast it. Well, let's think about that. I mean, NSF is interested in they're getting money. They want to put that money to use. They want to justify the use of that money to Congress so they get more money every year. Uh, but there have to be, you know, NSF looks to us to be good shepherds and stewards of that money. And the, the biggest way that they can demonstrate worth to Congress is that new companies creating new jobs, new inventions that move the needle, improve technology in the lives of everyone. Uh, from tech transfer's point of view, they own assets. They want to develop them. They would like to make money because that money comes in. They benefit. So they're not exactly aligned, but I think the motivations uh, are certainly to do good and uh, push technology out that works and, you know, make, make money in, in the good sense. So I don't think they're too far apart. Chris? Yeah, let me ask a different question. Uh, from what I can gather uh, at your university and um, seen that other universities, there is a push to facilitate faculty to bring technology to market. But then that depends on whether a faculty is willing and able to do this. And yesterday, uh, there were some pretty good arguments that faculty or most faculty um, don't know how to do this, or maybe they're not the best actors to do this. Why don't universities take the approach of actually establishing another machinery that will be doing this? I mean, the faculty are good at producing technology. Why don't they put in place a machinery that knows how to connect the business and allow them to be the ones that ably and expertly would facilitate the technology uh, transfer? Well, great question. I think uh, 
in one sense, many do. And particularly if you're a large, large university, you have a lot of resources. If you're Stanford, uh, Harvard, Yale, uh, large endowments, you probably have the resources to do a lot of those things. Here, we have programs like i we do lunch and learns, we try to uh, get faculty uh, motivated and trained, developed to do those types of things. But you kind of hit the nail on the head a little bit. There, there are some people who, some faculty members who are want to be actively involved kind of every step of the way and others who just kind of want to say, turn it over to tech transfer and go do it. And I would say the challenge with that latter example typically is money and resources because there are far more ideas than most smaller tech transfer offices have in terms of either manpower uh, or money. For example, um, each tech transfer office probably has a budget of X for patent expenses. So one of the challenges is for everybody that comes to them, they have to really do kind of a triage of deciding, um, you know, are we going to be able to pay patent expenses and just how much, how far? Is it U.S.? Do we go to Europe? Do we include Japan? Do we cut it off the U.S.? Or do we not file at all and tell the faculty member, uh, you know, you you have to go do this because we just don't see any potential. And that's one of the that's one of the tougher conversations to have with the faculty member. But but that happens. So um, we are doing it to a certain extent. Uh, probably not as well as we could if we had more resources and money. Um, but it, I think, you know, honestly, it, it depends. The, the easiest ones are the faculty members who make the time to kind of uh, proactively work with tech transfer. Because this, I mean, it takes a lot of time. Uh, it most, uh, I mean, these things do not happen overnight. They probably take at a minimum, uh, well, years. And then in, in life sciences, it could be a decade of working on it. Um, but great question. I'm sorry I don't have a better answer. Alec? Colonel? Yeah, sorry to, to uh, unmute. And I, I'll get the floor here in a minute, so I don't want to take much more, much of your time here. But the, the question of NSF aligning uh, with tech transfer offices. Uh, we had a discussion, a brief discussion yesterday about NSF abil NSF's ability to get credit for successes. And so uh, while you mentioned that NSF, if they promote uh, uh, i -Corps and they promote uh, S SIBRs and STTRs and IUCRCs, and those, those things have success outside the realm of a report. So for example, a, if a PI files their final report on a TTP award and a, as a, a break even or in the whole company that's not growing, and then a year and a half later, they, they their success explodes, there's not really a mechanism in place uh, to be able to uh, retain that is one of the uh, discussions mm -hmm. that was made. Uh, and, and I'm not sh is, is that what I heard? Was Jeremy, uh, is that what I heard yesterday, Jeremy? Yeah, this is part of a, a broader issue that we have at NSF is that once the final report is submitted, we don't hear anything else officially mo most of the time. So if um, uh, if you start a billion dollar company uh, a year after your award is over, we don't know about it unless we read it in the papers or, you know, you get patents after uh, uh, issued after the uh research is done, we don't get not of any notification. So it's just a problem. We have tracking information. So sometimes it's hard for us to know when we've been successful with our investments and when we haven't. So if I could chime in here, I just uh, I do know on the i -Corps side, this doesn't cover the broader element of all the other grants that are out there. But if you um, are involved in i -Corps, particularly at the national level. I just completed a survey from NSF last week, which asked me how many patents, how many industry contacts, uh, you know, how much money have you raised, a asking me kind of the information that you're talking about uh, right. that would be good to know. You know, how right. many, has another company- i, I, -Corps, I is a different animal. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So that information does come through the i -Corps, but uh, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, I don't recall in any of the reporting I've done in the past being asked those questions. 
Because yeah, we have no way to ask you. I mean, once the award is done, yes. we, we can't ask you questions because of the Paperwork Reduction Act. We can't go out and say, hey, what? A, can you give me a report on what happened on this after the award was done? We're not allowed to ask. Yeah, and just to clarify, Michael, you're saying you've answered these questions while, you, while you're a PI participating in the i program or within the reporting period, right? I mean, is that right? Actually, this was uh, this. I think survey came as a result of our being. We were uh, we were on a national team. I was the industry mentor for the national okay. team, and this so uh, this was five years later. Okay. Yeah, in well, some cases, ICOR can do stuff like that because they'll uh, those questions sometimes. And I don't know about your specific case. Sometimes those questions aren't coming from NSF, but they're coming from a contractor who's asking the questions. And they just happen to be useful to NSF, but NSF isn't allowed to ask them to ask the questions. You know, I think you're exactly right. As I recall, that may have come from VentureWell. Yeah. The it, second, it's very funny how these things work. No, no sorry. The second part of my question, and I don't know, Michael, if you're the uh, right one to ask or if Jeremy or, or if there's anybody on here. I, I wanted to ask it yesterday before we let Rob get away, but but I didn't sneak it in. So when uh, when someone has a technology that's ready to go to market, uh, will NSF fund uh, the transition process to it, whether through i or CIBR or through uh, a, a designation in the core program? If there is IP restrictions, if so, my, the note I made to myself is my recollection is that NSF is IP averse. That means if I want to take a cybersecurity product to market that I created using an NSF grant, but I have sold some portion of the IP to an investor, will NSF allow me to use that product or that technology within a submission for further TTP funding? Does anyone know the answer to that? What are you trying to get the money to do? To to the anything that the the uh, TTP process will fund the, in that particular program. Again, I'm again I'm not familiar tremendously familiar with how ICOR works, but but I know that the uh, TTP or I, my understanding is a TTP designation provides funding to allow you to take prior prior completed research to market doing things like hiring. Uh, a mentor or or uh, creating a uh, business plan or those kinds of things. And I'm just wondering if if the product has IP already, some portion of IP is already gone, will it be, is it possible? To, to me, the, the critical, I got tripped up when you said ready for market. Because uh, if it's ready for market and I were a reviewer, I might say, well, if you're ready for market, why do you need any more money? Uh, you know, because you should, if you're ready for market, you should already have a business plan. Your mentoring's done. You're ready to start sales. So it's, that's, I guess, my, yeah. I was just kind of focusing on what you needed the money for if you were ready for market. Right. That's uh, that's not what I intended to, the, the connotation of what I intended to say. What I intended to say was for the, again, for the TTP designation, you have a, a product that has been, has finished its development. You've got a you've got the papers are written, the prototypes in place, but none of the TTP is done. Anyway, it, it's probably not the right question for me. No, I, no, I, it's I, it's it's a good question because I'm a I'm a co-PI on a partner for innovation grant uh, with uh, one of our engineering faculty, and that particular grant covered a uh, uh, IP landscape analysis uh, and some. Uh, grad student time, as I recall. So uh, it may not be TTP, but there, I know there are grants out there that can cover things like that. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy, Thanks. I'm sure knows more than I do, but. Uh, Actually, I don't. I, I <laughs> would uh, defer to one of my colleagues who handles more of the TTP stuff. I manage more of the research side. Thank you so much for your, um, time this morning, Michael. We're going to wrap this up and move on to the next section. Um, okay. Great being with you all. Thanks so much. You, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Take care. So we'll go ahead and turn this over to um, Alex to talk about barriers faced by academic researchers. Okay. 
So I, I'm not certain if, if Michael is able to stay with us, uh, but what you will hear in this presentation is kind of the the uh, the counter uh, uh, to uh, the tech transfer office. The the I made a note in the chat here just a minute ago that point of view is is critical. And uh, Michael and I have been good friends for years. He mentioned that we worked together on the IUCRC, but we became friends well before that when he was president of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and so I know that uh, he has done great things in our trans our tech transfer office and in, uh, in the research office. And so let me just say that any negative connotations you take from anything that I say here doesn't apply to the University of South Alabama uh, office because we've we fixed most of these things, but uh, I have a pretty much experience uh, around uh, the, the the United States dealing with tech transfer uh, offices, and so I, I don't I don't say that these things are endemic that they're necessarily true in all places, but the goal of this presentation is to try and raise issues that uh, uh, faculty members should know about. When they engage the tech, the tech transfer office, and it's not just I'm, I'm sorry, when they engage tech transfer, that's the the issue when you're a faculty member and uh, and you're getting ready to uh, engage TTP. Uh, the the items that I raise here are, are things that, that you need to think about. And if you've done this before, uh, if you've been in, if you're on our on our call now uh, and, and you've done these things before and you've seen things that I'm missing or things that you can amplify, please jump in uh, because this is, uh, this is this is things that we're recording this and we got it for posterity and we wanna be sure that that these items are addressed. And, and again, Michael pointed out he was uh, going from scars. I'm also going from scars, places where I've, I have personally run into uh, difficulty uh, getting the TTP process done in academia. And again, you'll see when I'm specifically speaking about tech transfer offices, but what I am speaking about is, is what happens in academia, what happens with faculty members, what kind of things do they run into, and then uh, ultimately we want to be able to overcome those issues so that we can have effective tech, uh, tech transfer. Uh-oh. All right. Um, the reason why would a faculty member ever engage TTP is a, a pretty good starting question. Uh, typically, folks go to go into uh, academia because they want to teach and they want to do research. And, and generally speaking, research is recognized as, as publishing papers, creating new knowledge. And, and you publish the paper as the out, outcrop of the, uh, the knowledge that's gained. That's what you're doing. You want to create a contribution to knowledge. You want to let your ideas compete in the marketplace, which is uh, the conference uh, uh, cycles and the, the editorial boards that you have to navigate to have your, your the knowledge that you've created be codified. But there are a lot of things that you can do that still fit that model that TTP encourages. It, the impact of the research, and we've had several people mention this, the benefit to society and and what impact your research has. And, and with basic research, uh, some, there's basic research that uh, you don't see the input and, uh, or the impact for years and years and years. Uh, what we're talking about with TTP is being able to get into the laboratory, create new knowledge, uh, do the academic, more basic research process of, of um, publishing the papers, but then take that to a place where it goes into use. And I mentioned the example yesterday of having a colleague that engaged me at lunch, and I, I, I'm proud that I have a, in that technology is, is in practice, it's in use, it's being used by businesses today. And that gives you a, a, a personal, some personal satisfaction, and it can help a reputation as well if done right. Uh, there's also a, a, an important aspect of diversity in, in research. It, I've, uh, as I've advised junior faculty members, particularly, uh, it, it, trying to focus exclusively on basic research is not a healthy plan, uh, either for your uh, in, in personal success or for your reputation in the field. Having a diversity of research that, that research that spans research and development, some educational aspects of your technical field also maybe can be a good thing for you to have in the long term. Uh, NSF also provides a, a lot of money 
to support taking ideas into the marketplace. So being a TTP person, uh, is it can be very beneficial to you being able to extend your NSF funding. And of course, the reason that everybody thinks you go into TTP is the profit, you the Zuckerberg model, the Google model. Uh, we discussed yesterday the billions of dollars that roll in when you create this uh, best product in the world. And there's nothing wrong with uh, having the idea that you're going to make it uh, in the uh, commercial world through tech transfer. That's not an unreasonable uh, goal to have. It, you also, and, and this is uh, one of the things that, that Michael and I found out uh, working through the IUCRC and through our CFITS uh, center here uh, uh, with projects, is that faculty can form long-term industry connections. Uh, uh, for example, with uh, Cisco Corporation was, was one of our uh, industry partners on some of these things that we've done. We have faculty members that, that have now become pretty good friends with the development teams in Cisco and uh, have, have a very positive long-term uh, industry connections there. It, it also gives students uh, great opportunities. Uh, we run an internship program, uh, of course, that allows uh, industry partners to hire our students. But when you can, can have uh, industry working with uh, a faculty member and their students, that doubles your benefit. And so there are, there are a ton of reasons why being able to do uh, TTP can be very healthy. Uh, for your uh, academic career. So uh, there is uh, some inertia, some reason from an, an administrative point, putting on my dean hat and my dean glasses uh, from uh, uh, several years as dean here, being able to have TTP on your uh, resume can have some good things and it can be good for you personally. On the other hand, uh, the uh, faculty workload model has uh, uh, teaching research and service in general. Uh, and and uh, at the University of South Alabama, our teaching load is 60 percent. Our, our, our research, or we actually use the term development, uh, is 30 percent by the faculty handbook and then 10 percent for service. Uh, if you look at a, a, a Carnegie One, uh, very high research organization, typically that'll be inverse. You will have about 30 percent teaching and then 60% in your uh, research or development area, uh, and then 10% uh, in service. But, but the fact of the matter is, they typically, while they may say, they may use the term uh, development, the model is established uh, largely to support the three areas at the bottom of the bubble here, teaching, uh, research, and service. And what's missing? Well, there's no TTP in that. Uh, and so uh, the ability, and, and Michael mentioned it in his discussion, was that the ability to attain academic uh, professional credit for work you do in TTP, there's, there is not a good model for that that I've seen uh, anywhere, uh, uh, but uh, that doesn't mean it's not possible, and, and I'll ask that question here in just a minute, but, but being able to uh, identify faculty success in the, in the TTP area and then to align that with a standard, some kind of a rubric that would allow uh, uh, evaluation decisions to, to use that, that model has not been put in place yet. So I want to address now a few of the key TTP impediments that I've seen uh, and that I think uh, and I've heard of. Uh, this one uh, I heard fairly recently. It was actually uh, yesterday, uh, Anoop uh, mentioned that faculty incentives are not well suited uh, for tech transfer. And so that's, we now have a quote uh, that uh, agrees with my observation uh, as well. And in fact, we also heard almost exactly the same words from Angelos uh, yesterday. They both talked about their experiences uh, as faculty members conducting uh, research in an academic environment, and they both indicated the incentives are not well suited for that. And so what I'd like to do now is to just pose that question to the, to the workshop. Uh, is it fixable in the short term? And I, I don't know what, um, uh, what I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to this. Is there a way to uh, incentivize faculty uh, in the short term to uh, that that can help convince faculty members that TTP is important and that maintains a reasonable uh, a reasonable model of, of faculty evaluation. How can you compare someone whose success is in the TTP area with someone whose success is in the 
basic research and publication area. Any, any thoughts on that from the floor? Raise your hand, just jump on in, please. Oh, this is Fred. <clears throat> Sorry for my sore throat here. I think the process is exploited. I think that the way all of this stuff works at the university, um, you know, professors are underpaid compared to comparable pay elsewhere. They get a small percentage of royalties on their good ideas and their hard work. And now you're trying to say, well, we should, uh, we should have tech, tech transfer, but there's no reward in place for it other than a small percentage, if it's successful of royalties. <clears throat> and uh, so it's not just that the incentives are not well suited for it. It's that it's downright exploitive. The professor who does their research, gets their funding from NSF and forgets TTP, will probably do a lot better in terms of their progress until you uh, become a tenured faculty member, you know, once you're a, a full professor, perhaps you can do this because you can sort of walk away from your other responsibilities. And there's not much they can do to you. So is it fixable in the short term? It's fixable, but nobody's going to fix it, right? The incentives for the university itself are not aligned to fix it. And, you know, my experience is you're not going to fix it for the faculty if, if the university um, doesn't benefit from it. Other thoughts? So I'll jump in here. Um, Alec, let me sort of pose, I really wonder if this is perhaps the wrong question. And my motivation for this is, you know, since the last six months since I left academia, I've been sitting in our um, local incubator and had a little more exposure to this. And one thing that's become very clear to me is, allow me a generalization for a moment, is there sort of two kinds of people I see sitting in there? And there's a big difference between the um, academic who's got a great idea and is trying to start a business versus what I see as a crowd of sort of serial professional entrepreneurs, right? The latter is a bunch of folks who have tried and failed perhaps to start a number of businesses, had some successes, but this is really their profession is starting businesses. And compared to them, these folks who are sort of gotten one great idea out of academia and are trying to run with it really look like amateurs and it's a it's a, and it's a very kind of unfair playing ground and i think another thing that i heard yesterday in anoop and angelos and whatever is you know sort of people in the team make all the difference so i really wonder here if we're not trying to break a model by having the professor carry this research forward to commercialization, if that's just not a non-starter. And really what we need to be figuring out how to do is how do we take the research and pass it off to the next person in the relay race to move forward into, into commercialization. So I just wanted to, to pose that thought. Yeah, that's, that's a great thought, Vaughn. I appreciate very much. Other thoughts? Hi, Alec, it's Florence. May I make a comment? Please do. So it's great to see everybody again, my TTP family. So um, like Vaughn, I've been spending, yeah, I'm still in academia at Columbia University now, but I've been spending time on the Princeton Alumni Angels. And we've talked about this before, some of us together, they're alumni angel groups at universities. And I agree with what y'all are saying, especially what Vaughn was saying. So, you know, I'm work, I've been working on some deals and there's some IP related to universities, but those aren't the people bringing it to market. <laughs> they, they team up with somebody else that understands it well. Um, in one case, they actually got um, a $1.8 million SBIR from NIH, this new person, <laughs> right? They got a phase one through the university, then a phase two through the entrepreneur. And now they're bringing that to market with the entrepreneurial bent. And this is very interesting. And it sings directly to what we're all talking about. Researchers are in research because they want to do research. You know, there are researchers who told me that when we were doing the TTP, they're like, Florence, <laughs> I'm in research because that's what I want to do, you know? And so to try 
to act like they're not successful because they're not TTPing all the way. I don't know if that's really fair, you know? So one of the things that Anita brought up, and I think some of us have been talking about is now that we have this tip directorate, which is across all the, you know, the others and NSF. So they could work with multiple, not just cybersecurity TTP opportunities. And their job is technology and innovation and partnerships. That's really what I think we're aiming at. Um, and I think that that would be a more suitable opportunity to look at how we actually bring that all together and not make the researcher feel like they're not successful if they don't bring it all the way to market because they're not trained to do that. They don't want to do that. You know, one of the researchers, I, I still keep in touch with a number of them that I met through the work that I did with Vaughn at IU and Alec with you and Anita. And um, so I continue to give them opportunities, and I'll talk about this later today, to present their research and connect with agencies and connect with people and institutions that may want to bring it forward. But they always step back into their research, into their, you know, dean position or their chair position, because that's where they live. You know, um, so I think we, as compared to saying, you know, you're a fish, why can't you run a marathon? I think we should say, you're a fish, you, you know, you swim really well. <laughs> now, when we get to the next leg of this, like Iron Man thing, who should we get? <laughs> you know, um, that's how it feels. So I, I think we're saying similar things. Maybe I'm taking a different bent or just bringing it, you know, um, down to a, a couple of different examples, but that's how it feels. I don't think it's the incentive. They just don't want to. I don't think it's a financial incentive. It's a personal incentive. Well, and as we discussed uh, yesterday, Florence, I'm in 100% agreement with you. Uh, I think it's a very a, a great observation to make and a great time to make it. Um, uh, I think that another issue here is that that faculty members aren't generally equipped or trained or skilled to to take it. And, and I'll use this term. I don't know if this is exactly the right term, but it, what, what you were talking about sounded to me like kind of a last mile. So you let the faculty member do the um, do the technology and, and uh, build a, a develop a a prototype, a working prototype, a proof of concept, uh, and then find a way to be able to take that uh, idea and, and, and move it through a TTP process, uh, picking it up from the faculty member in some way that's equitable. I mean, it sounded to me like you were saying that this, this uh, uh, entrepreneur you were talking about that got the, the additional funding grants for TTP may have a, a, taken some advantage of the faculty member with the idea. Was that what you were suggesting or, or were you saying no, that's a healthy? No, healthy it's process? very healthy. No, there's an IP <laughs> agreement and all, no, it's all very up and up, open, open, collaborative and partnering. Um, so the researchers in academia get to keep doing their thing. They got the SBIR phase one, partnering with this new entity that got the SBIR phase two, working with them. Um, because they don't want to do all this, you know, find the channel and gotcha. do the pilot and, and you know, wrestle the industry partner to the ground, <laughs> you know, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, get a cap table going and get more investment and how are you going to get it to market? So that's what the entrepreneur is doing. And they have a very clear, reasonable IP relationship with, with um, the university that they're working with. And I think it's it depends on your perspective. It's the last mile if you created the technology. It's the first mile if you're the entrepreneur. You know, it's like, okay, now I'm going to take this ball, you know, and I'm going to run with it. Um, so I think we've been very focused on the research and the technology side and then saying, but just like bring it to market, for goodness sake, what's your problem? But on the entrepreneurial side and actually developing the business and having a longitudinal view and a five-year business plan, the researchers don't want anything to do with that. If they did, they would jump over into the entrepreneurial role. And for those who don't, like I said, we shouldn't say, you know, you're a fish. Why can't you run a marathon? You know, I think that, gosh, you guys swim great, <laughs> you know? Um, now, how do we um, get to the next leg? Great. That's uh, great observations. Thank you all very much. And then I, uh... Uh, there'll be some opportunity for more. And, and I think the how there that I just asked, we've now seen uh, some ideas and, and I think that's a, a, a great way to move forward. 
so we also uh, I, I asked the question in the in the short term. Uh, what about in the long term? Uh, so what are the uh, right faculty incentives? And and I think uh, you've answered this from your from the perspective that you've given. Florence, is that that what we we really should be thinking about more is a way to create maybe cookie cutter uh, contracts, maybe uh, some type of institutionalized stakeholder meetings that allows, uh, uh, and I believe Fred yesterday mentioned, and I'll mention again in my slides, having a, a, a CEO's meeting, a, a, a wannabe CEO's meeting to be able to pair folks that do the last mile of the TTP process or lead the last mile of the TTP process. Uh, and, and so what are the right faculty incentives uh, for getting the the uh, the product through some level of TTP? Uh, and, and if we wanted that to stay with the faculty, uh, would it make sense to reduce uh, some publication requirements or uh, are there other ideas reduced, of course, reduced teaching loads uh, uh, or do we are we uh, suggesting that it might be possible to have uh, faculty members in a department that have some type of a tenure like position, uh, but who focus on transferring uh, research into the uh, into use? Uh, does anybody see any use in those or are these ideas that uh, really should be uh, moved into the as, as Florence said into a last mile? Position. Any thoughts there from the uh, from the group from the floor? I'll just say Florence was correct <laughs> in everything she said. The um, <laughs> I think it's exactly the opposite of what you want to do. I think <clears throat> basically publication is the way you get technology out into practice <laughs> in a university. You share the results. So other people can turn them into practical things. Reduce teaching loads. Uh, you know that's just whether you're doing research or teaching. I don't think that has a substantial uh, differentiation. Um, the durable tenure-like research faculty positions. Um, my understanding is that tenure is becoming less durable, not more durable, and and tenure is almost something that sort of doesn't exist in the way it used to exist. So I, I just, uh, I think it's great to fully fund people to do research and development, but you know, the business model of the university is not that. Right. If I may, um, this is uh, also something that I brought up earlier and the previous speaker uh, said that uh, it's a matter of resources for the university. Uh, I will reiterate that, um, say for myself, speaking personally, if I saw an opportunity that what I do in terms of research can become commercialized or uh, usable uh, commercially or in other sectors of the industry, what have you, I would be very, very happy. But I do not know how to go about it. I do not know how to find all this talent that people were speaking about yesterday. And the question I asked the, uh, earlier was, why doesn't the university do that? Why doesn't the university take up that role of taking what I have and finding the right people to do this? And the answer that I got was that it's a matter of resources. Well, I'm thinking, if there is value into something, how come there are no resources? Okay, you may not have the money at hand, but then you can always facilitate a forum where you can get the people who have the money, who are looking for ideas and bring them into the university and say, here, there is a bunch of ideas. What do you think about them? Would you like to take up some of them? Why wouldn't that be something that the university could do, any university could do. So I'm, I don't think it's uh, accurate to say it couldn't do it. I think it, that universities can do it. I think uh, what Michael was pointing out and what I think Fred's pointing out as well is, is at some point, every institution has to identify its core 
capabilities and its core uh, goals and mission. And uh, universities at this point to my, are, are generally not uh, accepting that uh, the TTP is, is uh, valuable to their long-term health and largely because it's, it's uh, tech transfer is, is only a uh, significant, my understanding is only a significant input vector for a very few universities. Um, I, Anita notes in the chat that uh, there are incubators in some uh, universities, and and there are, and and they they most, in fact, many universities that have a research park will have some sort of resources that can help uh, faculty members, and and I'll uh, try to touch on that just a little bit too here in the next slide. Thank you all very much for those comments here. Um, the risk to a faculty member, I think we've talked about some of this already, and so I just want to touch on these as we go through. Uh, it certainly is true that a tenure track faculty member uh, is putting, ha has a risk uh, in, on their career of engaging TTP. Uh, if, that, if it distract, detracts from their ability to publish papers and keep their uh, research record intact and to graduate to, to then then the, there's a real question out there about whether a tenured track but not yet tenured faculty member should engage TTP because it's very high risk. Uh, if if the the uh, papers aren't published, if the students don't graduate, then then a faculty member is not may not be tenured, and that could be a, a huge impact on their their career. But it's not just tenures of uh, faculty members that are tenured. Uh, and they engage in TTP and reduce their publication record may risk uh, promotions or, or raises in any given year. So there are other impacts on the career beyond just the tenure decision. Uh, it's just they're a different, uh, a different level of magnitude. Tenure is a, a one shot or, or at the most you might get a second shot, but it's usually not a real shot, but uh, it could be. But the promotion and raises are annual that, that happen on career. Uh, you could even have a, a faculty member that's tenure track uh, at their third year review, they may not be continued. So it's a very high risk uh, activity, particularly for the very young faculty, and there would be a real reason for me to need to, to want to give them that, that recommendation to do that. Uh, uh, faculty members, are, 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 I guess, and, and others can help me. Uh, Michael Chambers knows a lot more about this than I do, but, and Fred, uh, when you form a company, there's liability associated with that company. And, and depending on what you do and how you do it, uh, that can be to the people that, that are depending on you to make this company work, can be to you personally, your financial liability uh, as well, and it, because m many faculty members invest so much sweat equity, and I'll mention here in, here in a little while, that they don't have an opportunity to turn the, the profit in the uh, in another uh, area. So uh, there's a there is liability that goes along with creating these things. Your reputation as a researcher, as a professional, uh, are also can also be impacted by a startup that causes uh, that that doesn't uh, isn't successful. The loss of family time and, and revenue generating time uh, and stress over uh, the from the sweat equity that you put in uh, a, a company starting up a new company can be can be very devastating, very difficult to overcome. And and when I listen to to people like Fred talk about uh, starting a company, don't don't do it unless you mean it. Don't do it unless you're all in. And if you're all in, then that means long days, long weeks. And a lot of stress, and so those are those are impediments certainly, uh, and risk to faculty members. Uh, are there things missing? And when, do you have ideas on the greatest risk? And any anyone that's done this, did you know these risks going in? Uh, GE or or any of the other entrepreneurs we have on the line started businesses. Did you know these risks going in? Uh, was this the greatest risk you saw? And what or or are there others that are more important? Okay, nothing from the floor. Moving on, then. Uh, um, Alec, I'm I'm sorry, a um, little slow. One thing I just want to mention is all those risks pre tenure are so large as to be overwhelming to faculty, is my experience. So, really, the way the tenure process is set up until they hit tenure, faculty can't spend any time on TTP collaboration, almost anything but tenure. 
Yeah, that's that's my experience as well, Vaughn, and that was why I posed the the question: should you should a tenure track faculty engage that? But I believe we have several fac several tenure track faculty members that have done it successfully uh, that I've engaged with and that have been on this pa these panels. But uh, it's a it's a risky operation. Let's see, I see another chat I don't want to miss. Got got it. Okay, good. Thank you. All right, so. I had another couple of quotes from yesterday from the same two gentlemen. Universities are ill-equipped for TTP. So I'll talk about some of Chris's problems uh, now, and, and I want you to think about, is it fixable? I'm going to give you what my perspective of tech transfer office challenges are. And again, please take this as I'm, I'm taking the uh, uh, Eeyore, uh, the uh, grouch approach here and looking at this from the worst possible perspective, and it doesn't reflect uh, any specific uh, institution, any specific university, but it gives you my uh, oversight and, and my uh, thoughts on the, these models. Uh, one of the key issues in doing business uh, is your ability to respond to things quickly and promptly when they are needed. Uh, in academia, time is measured in semesters, uh, and that means that you hire faculty, hire students largely on semester boundaries, uh, midterm and final exam schedules may dictate student work schedules, and student hours are rigorously uh, controlled uh, through the payroll process, and, and working students more hours than is allowed is a very di difficult and dangerous thing to do, and uh, uh, students that, that, that underwork, it's hard to be able to recoup those hours, so if a student is, is uh, takes a week off, for example, for spring break, those hours are essentially lost to the to the contract because they can't, in most cases, the rules for that govern uh, student interactions are pretty uh, rigorously followed. Uh, even just getting students to work over a break, over the Christmas break, can be challenging to do. There may be paperwork involved and there may be limitations on, on students that can, can be worked. And this is, this is just one of the aspects of uh, uh, student student labor that you're working with that you may or may not see. But I guarantee you in a business model, the semester timing issue is certainly important. The word profit generally isn't in the academic vocabulary. And, and what I mean there, and, and again, this is not a, 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 a terrible pejorative, it's, I, I believe it's true, but I don't believe that university administration is motivated by your potential profit or loss. Uh, they are motivated by uh, other things. And, and I'll tell you something I tell folks around me, the easiest answer for an administrator to give to you to a request is no. Uh, no rarely ever gets an administrator fired. It, it is a word that is a very, very powerful word. And so being able to uh, get to a yes answer of uh, when, when profit is your goal is going to be a very difficult thing to do. Uh, when you're con trying to convince someone to take on liability, for example. I thought this was a, 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 a the first time I've thought of it exactly this way, actually, in putting together the presentation for today, is that uniform guidance uh, is not uniform and it's not guidance. Uniform guidance is a, a set of rules that uh, govern or that require audits and oversight for money that's spent in relationship to federal a contribution. So if uh, you have federal money involved, then that project is li likely subject to uniform guidance requirements. And that means that there's going to be a lot of accounting done, a lot of uh, oversight and paperwork done. If you're audited, that's extremely time consuming and extremely difficult. Uh, it really is a massive oversight overhead. And so that's an, part of the academic model that you can't get away from. The university if it does federal funding, it will uh, com uh, comport with uniform guidance uh, details. And so you'll have to deal with that as a, a PI or TTP person. Alec, looks like Florence has a question. I'm sorry. Thank you, Florence. Thank you, Anita. Yeah, just a couple of things on, I have students that work for me part-time at Columbia under the hub um, and under my COVID Info Commons awards. And actually during the break, they can work 40 hours a week. <laughs> so it's the opposite of what you're saying. So I think it's specific to each institution. And actually they could work 
unlim actually the, the term is unlimited and they mean it but i'd have to pay them overtime time and a half for overtime over 40 hours so i think all of these are i think we have to be careful i think we're at the stage now with ttp that we've been trying to hone in like this and now it's time to go broader and say what are we missing what don't we know and and what's a, a good way to look at it so that's one of the things um that i wanted to share and um there are a few other things but i want you to finish all your thoughts and then i'll i'll come back to that but this one was like a couple of slides back okay uh, I, okay thank you florence i appreciate that and yes i, I know that the things vary and yeah. and it may be that it's not a problem anymore and, and i know deborah knows all of the answers about how students can work at university of south alabama but i was caught off guard by many of the limitations and the issues that are caused by some of the medical uh, insurance requirements we had that com connected to working hours. And that's just one example of something that I wasn't aware of that that uh, for to not have to pay or to not have to treat somebody as a full time uh, uh, insured person, they can't work a certain number of hours. Yeah, so it, it, and it, yeah, it varies. You're right. So I'm just saying this is another example that actually blew me away. I was like, what do you mean by unlimited? They said, actually, in this case, it really means unlimited. I'm like, seriously? Yeah. You know, so I think it, you know, it's specific to each area. Regarding universities and profit, I, I think one of the stages we're at now with TTP is we've been saying this is how we should do it. And this is how we've been trying to do it. And it's not working. So we have to fix something so that our model works, is that we need to lo look at what the researchers really want and what the universities really want, you know, and, and I think we need to have a better feel for the ecosystem and these partnerships. So from that perspective on the profit, it's not that universities don't want money. They love money, right? We all love money, but they look at the bang for the buck and how much time they can spend on each of these things and what the potential value is. If it's warfarin, it works out great, right? You have a whole building, <laughs> you have all sorts of stuff going on. So I, I think we, I think we have to be, uh, I don't know how to say this, uh, more mature in the way we approach this now. Like we have all of this input and some of it we wish weren't what it is, but it is. So I think we have to look at it. I, we don't have to, but I think we have an opportunity to look at it differently. Uh, I Yeah. And that's again, part of what this workshop is all about, Florence. And I appreciate you uh, very much uh, bringing that up, that we do need to look at things differently. And again, remember my premise here was that I'm looking at this from the uh, from the grouch side, from the uh, <laughs> and, and trying to point out the potential negatives that we see. So not that I'm in general in, in general negative about most of these things. I understand, but I'm trying to raise these issues uh, for awareness. Thank you. Uh, thank you. All right. Uh, uh, this is another place where I was caught off guard. Uh, in universities, custom contracts are painstakingly slow. And, and there are several reasons for this, is that the university system is not meant to respond to a market. Uh, it's not built to respond to a business pace uh, of creating contracts to get things done. And, and they are governed by oversight. And again, part of this is the fact that we have federal funding involved and we have state requirements that are involved. And so many of the many of the contracting issues have lots of steps in them uh, to have the proper oversight and the, the ability to move things through. Uh, then the, the fifth tenet there is that all contracts are custom contracts. And, you know, Michael Chambers would argue with that and he'd, he'd say that that's not exactly true because we have templates. And that's a fact. We do have a lot of templates in this day and age. But if there are essentially, if there are any changes at all, that generally will trigger backtracking through multiple, if not all, steps. Now, again, this may be a more broad generalization than is, than is accurate, than is 100% accurate. But it's my experience that creating contracts is in, in universities that, that, are, that support a TTP in incentive of having multiple contracts in place to get uh, a product through some type of a transfer uh, mode and some level of marketability and the, the folks that are going to be your early adopters to be able to do that with contracts is just it you've got to realize what the time uh, frame is for this happening. 
Uh, the, even the term research faculty is generally not not well defined, or at least uh, may not be well defined in in all organizations all the time, for sure. Uh, so in in at South Alabama, we might have research researchers that are staff or that are faculty. They might be on a nine month or a twelve month contract. Some of these folks, depending on the kind of contract and the needs of the, the organization, may have a teaching assignment. Uh, the issue of whether they're, uh, what the contract looks like may have a, a negative effect on your ability to deal with international uh, team members. And again, these things are based a lot of the times on university policy of how the faculty handbook is written. And so this is another potential uh, impediment to uh, TTP in academia. Uh, someone mentioned this before, and I and I talked about it briefly. But you you can't just pay students. There is a policy, a standard by what you pay students. Do you have? And and again, some of it's due to federal funding requirements. Some of it simply by local policy. You you have to pay students in most cases according to some university established rate. Or if you've written it into a grant, you may be able to overwrite that. But there's organizational structure that you have to go through to determine how you pay uh, fact, uh, students. And, and while you think paying students is a fairly easy thing to do, it really isn't. It's, uh, it can have a, uh, any nuance to what you want to do to, to meet your TTP challenge, your ability to get to market, can, can struggle in the administration of academia. And there may be fees attached to some of the pay that you have to pay fringe benefits or, or fees, those things could come in uh, potentially as well. And, and, and it all is case by case basis uh, in universities and in universities do these things differently. Deborah, how am I doing for time here? Okay. Started uh, a little late and we have a break after. So if you need to go a few minutes longer, that's fine. Okay, I will. So I'll also point out that when you're doing a, a, anything from which you may gain uh, profit, you have to be very careful to separate the business aspect of what you're doing from the academic assets uh, use of, of things that you're doing. Uh, you cannot, for example, use a university-owned computer to uh, create your business plan uh, in uh, if you're going to be paid for that business plan or uh, to to earn money that and so there has to be an ironclad separation of business and academic use of resources uh, and and similarly and this was mentioned I believe Michael mentioned this earlier that if you are working on a startup and if there is any funding to you coming to you as a as a way a point of salary you have to be extremely careful about conflict of commitment. Uh, again, university regulations are very specific about how much uh, effort you can contribute, and, and accounting of that time can be a very, very difficult thing to do. The definitions of what 10% uh, of your effort are, uh, are extremely difficult to discuss. I sat on a committee uh, an, uh, that uh, tried to come up with a way of of defining what it meant for someone to give 10% of an effort or one month's effort uh, on a, a particular activity. And it's for people that some people work 40 hours a week, some 60, some 25. And how do you measure percent of effort when you in those kinds of environments it becomes extremely difficult to do. Point uh, and 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 again, I'm just pointing out the issues that happen in academia. Not that they don't happen in in industry uh, as well, but certainly there are issues that I've run into. University space is sparse and expensive. Uh, if so, if you want to grow or you want to have a, a short term project that you need more space for, a lot of times it's very difficult to get. And uh, if, and if you can get it, it's going to be in a maybe in a limited location, and it's going to be limit. Uh, it's going to be expensive, and and uh, so those are some of the another set of impediments. Uh, two other of the key impediments, and Florence and I have discussed uh, the first of these many times, and and uh, put issues things in place, and and. Uh, uh, Florence has done some great things in that area and some things that are that have happened at the Trusted CI project uh, in, in finding the customer or what we call matchmaker. 
but that is a canonically hard thing to do. And, uh, and it, it remains a thorn in the side of, of TTP uh, uh, project uh, investigators. Building the team, I discussed a little bit yesterday in my introduction about how important the team is, and that's been mentioned before, and figuring out who does this. So I'm I'm in the uh, content. My contention is that ad hoc processes for number one and number two don't work, or at least they're inefficient. And these two processes need to be systematic in some way. Do, do I have any dissent on that? And recognizing that we only have five or six minutes left. I agree with it. So here's an example of finding the customer. And this is, uh, and I talked about uh, TTP in the small yesterday and uh, our center director uh, is a business person and they, uh, he uh, contacts through phone or uh, text, even text messages, uses mail, contacts businesses, new businesses every year and will go out and meet with some subset of the business that he reaches out to. The ones that respond and show interest, he will call or have a, his uh, executive director call and, and, and meet with uh, folks. And then uh, they'll end up with two or three partners a year. And this is a systematic approach to finding customers. And, and the way uh, he does that is he takes with him a portfolio of projects that they might be able to engage with our faculty. So that's the product that he's selling. It brings these folks in to be able to partner with our faculty members to use the products that they're developing in, in, in their research groups. Uh, Fred mentioned yesterday that he had this meeting of finding a CEO, which is the HR side of this. And, and this is a, I would call his organization, A2E, is in some sense a consortium. It's a group of stakeholders that have, have general interests, that have uh, common interests, uh, that get to know one another, that can find uh, mutual benefit over time. Uh, but the bottom line here is, is that that process is ongoing. This wasn't a one-time call. This is a process that will develop over time and evolve over time and have stability to be able to uh, create a, a, a resume file and a portfolio file of research that can, can then be balanced. And that's, those are two uh, systematic approaches to getting this done. Now, I want to touch real quickly uh, on and, and on the uh, tech transfer office. And as a reminder, I'm not opposed to tech transfer offices. I think they're great things. And what they want to be seen as, what they want to be, is a promoter of tech transfer for faculty members. But what they end up being a lot of times is the filter and the protect and the uh, uh, the police force in some sense for protecting the university. They want faculty members to succeed, but the bottom line is the, they, their mission that, that they are evaluated by and going to be uh, judged by is how well they protect the university. And again, liability means, liability protection doesn't necessarily mean protecting you from lawsuits, although they have an interest in that. They don't want you to be, fire, uh, 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 to be uh, sued either but their number one goal is protecting the university. And similarly with IP rights, they are interested in helping you protect your IP. And as was mentioned earlier, they're interested in helping the student get the, the percentage of the IP that's suitable to them. But they're really judged based on their ability to protect the university's share of future revenue. Uh, and so the bottom line is it's not, it's the university's best interests and the investigator's best interests aren't always in alignment. And so when you go in to work with the tech transfer office, as you must, if you're doing academic tech transfer with students and other faculty and in this, in this arena, uh, it's critical that you be in communication with your tech transfer office and use their resources the best you can. But you have to recognize that there are some uh, impediments uh, to that. Uh, I believe Fred and I are on the hook to talk about funding uh, in the next uh, session. And we will be talking about all of these bouncing issues. And uh, uh, um, hopefully we will have time in that process. I had failed to include Anita in the uh, agenda to talk about the accelerator 
and uh, and uh, hopefully Deborah, we we may can work work her in maybe at the end of uh, Fred's and my time uh, here before we uh, or, or uh, at, at an appropriate time in the okay. in the agenda today. So that's uh, that's it for me. Um, do you have questions for me that we might we have time for a question or two or a comment? Thank you all very much. Thank you, Alec. Okay, we're scheduled for a um, 15 minute break. So we will meet back at 10 o'clock to for um, Alec and Fred's session on funding. Thank you. Thank you. Alec, should I share my screen here? Uh, sure. Let's just get that all set up because, you know. So I've got your slide, Fred. Are you ready? Me? Okay, for some reason, it is doesn't want to uh, share my, allow my audio to work while I'm sharing my screen. <laughs> well, and that's because Fred, I know that I tested this out and I found this out <clears throat> yesterday. I screwed it up when I ran my video, but the reason is when you click on share screen. No, no, no I, I, I know, but I think it's fixed now, right? You can, can you see my screen and, and also listen, hear my audio? Oh yes. You're, you're talking about your audio. I thought you had audio with your, with uh, your screen. <clears throat> no, it okay. was. Um, uh, I got you. You know, stupid computers is what it's called. So if uh, if it's, uh, I think we talked about this, Fred. I'll just give a, a two or three, four minute overview of my perspective here on matchmaking and uh, and creating systematic relationships, and then uh, and then I'll sit with you and and pretty much follow your lead on the rest of the meeting. And if and if you go. Uh, uh, for 45 or 50 minutes and we don't have any questions and we'll uh, yield time to Anita to be able to talk briefly about the uh, convergence accelerator from NSF and then yeah, we'll can, jump into the last can, panel. Can you see my screen? Yes. How bizarre. And, and I'm going to change it and see if you can still see it. Hang on. Can you, did you see the change? No. Got it. Okay. So what has to happen here is I have to pause my voice to change slides. <laughs> oh, really? I think that's right. Maybe I can do it this way. You can still hear me, right? Yes, I can hear you. And let's see. Now I can try this. Did you see the screen change? No. Uh the screen's not changing. So it doesn't say cybersecurity in the top right hand corner? No, it's still your title screen. All right. I will just temporarily mute myself. God. Fred, you um, want me to pro project the slides for you? Um, I think we'll do okay. I think I you just talked to you. <clears throat> Sorry. No, I was going to say, if you talk and I, I just change the slides for you on my system. Do you have okay. a if you, copy? If you, if you go to all.net, you can actually uh, download a copy or open it in a new tab. From You just go to all.net and it's the first thing on the list of... The 
So Zoom being silly. Okay. I, I've got it up, Fred. I'm going to take a quick bio break. I'll be back in seven minutes. Okay. If you want me to project it, I will. But if you if you happy doing it, if you've got it, then uh, we'll leave it with you. I will figure it out. <clears throat> Okay, I think it's fixed. I'm still just seeing your title slide. Oh, well, here, do you see the next slide now? Yes, it did, it moved. Thank you. Yep, and, and you can still hear me. You're welcome. Yep, can hear you, I can see to, you. I had to not share my audio. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, you know. All right. I, the opposite of what Alex did yesterday, he shared his audio. He couldn't, he didn't share his audio, so he didn't hear it. <clears throat> I had to not share my audio, so we couldn't so we hear, can it. hear it. <laughs> Seems to be so working. we can't hear the audio from that, yes. but you can hear the audio from my microphone. Otherwise, you get feedback.
15 seconds. <clears throat> hey, if you don't start me on time. <clears throat> so Deborah, I have to ask, what is that? What is the mascot behind you? I should have looked it up, but is it? Um, we're the Jaguars. So there's a male and female Jaguar. I'm glad I didn't say they look like chipmunks. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. Chipmunks. <laughs> like Alvin and his friends, you know. Oh yeah, I would have to agree with you on that. <laughs> okay, well, we don't want to take up any more Fred's time. So Fred and Alec, y'all are on for funding for TPP. Shall I start? Um, it, it, let me kick it off, Fred, and then I'll turn it, uh, give it to you and let you pretty much carry the session. Fred has been doing this for a long, long time. Uh, and uh, the, the amount that I know about it is infinitesimally small in comparison. Uh, I met Fred, maybe he's maybe the person in this uh, or in, in academia that I know that have known the longest. I actually interviewed with him uh, when he was at one of the national laboratories and uh, was not yet rich and famous. And so uh, I've known him a long time and he's been doing this kind of thing and lived in that area for a long time. And so I've reached out to him several times to do things related to TTP. Uh, one of the things that uh, I had addressed with him was the notion of dealing, trying to deal with the matchmaking problem in academia, finding industry partners for faculty to be able to engage, uh, the, you know, generally speaking, uh, faculty member projects that are that are capable to be tech transferred uh, are not uh, retail, and if they're not retail, then finding a client, a customer, a, a first ad early adopter, a proof of concept uh, person, a refining uh, influence on the on that project product or project uh, is a very difficult thing to do in academia. It, you, using an advisory board, it can be helpful, but it it doesn't work. And as I, I put on my earlier slide, I think ad hoc processes to get this done, uh, speed dating, uh, uh, those kinds of activities, even the, you know going to, to trade shows, uh, trying to organize mixers, those are all valiant attempts, but they're not structured enough to be long-term, to have a, uh, a, a stabilizing, durable, quality to them to allow true relationships to form, which is what it takes to have those kind of, of uh, uh, activities together to be able to, to do business together in that way. And the, the A, to, A to E model that builds companies uh, incorporates many of these same type of activities into their routine business. And so I asked Fred if he would give us uh, and he and I have worked been several times through these presentate this presentation to to try and give a, a, the this workshop an, an idea of how these the hard things like staffing uh, the places where where you have gaps in your staff and and the ability to deal with funding issues where you have limited capability that the, the A to A to E model seems to me to be a pretty healthy model. Uh, that many of the folks that are interested in uh, tech transfer that could then do exactly what Florence describes of, of passing on the last mile or the last two miles or the middle three miles or whatever would work uh, through an organization like this. So I am pretty much going to step away here and turn this over to Fred. I remain on here, Fred, if there are things that you would have me to uh, uh, to. Uh, contribute. Otherwise, I'll leave the floor uh, to Fred Cohen, my, my friend and accomplished mentor. Oh, thank you, Alec. So I my throat's a little bit sore today. I had a COVID diagnosis yesterday and I'm taking my Paxlovid. So pardon my coughing and other stuff. The uh, technology is that thing on the left where you see these two people with the things on their heads. The rest of it is what it takes to get to adoption. So it's a long way and it takes a long time and a lot of effort and you can't do it alone. So fundamentally, where you start in the university is that that technology thing on the left and, and this last mile, it's not the last mile. You've gone the first mile and it's at least a marathon. Um, 
That doesn't mean that what you did is not valuable. It means it's incredibly valuable to justify the other, you know, 23 or however many miles involved in getting it into adoption. <clears throat> I know a little bit about technology to practice for cybersecurity. Um, this is just some of my relevant experience. So, and I'm gonna spend a few minutes on this slide because I think it's a little bit of storytelling doesn't hurt. Computer virus defenses is a nice uh, starting point. Um, I mentioned yesterday the cryptographic checksum uh, for integrity protection um, has at one point was uh, in about 75% of all the computers in the world, maybe 80. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, it got adopted in hardware about 20 years after it was first uh, published. Um, so that's the trusted platform module and uh, whitelisting uh, with cryptographic checksums is basically the same thing, uh, real-time detection of it and so forth. Uh, from this, I earned uh, nothing. Um, I did teach courses around the world and uh, had, a, had a good life, uh, but no royalties, no support for it, no money for it. Um, and uh, if I would have patented it at the time, it wouldn't have worked. Uh, somebody from the patent office suggested it, but the problem is, that at that point in time, you could not patent things like this. It was um, <clears throat> before the era when computer software type things were patentable. Um, I mentioned yesterday uh, the Radon project where we went from eight to 250 employees in about three months. That was a university project before it got rolled out. And it had you know very minimal challenges associated with the university um, uh, involvement. Um, <clears throat> the first uh, remote internet vulnerability scanner was also something uh, you know that I had uh, on the internet you know before anybody else or you know at the same time as the earliest other ones. That's a case where that became a billion dollar industry and I actually screwed up because uh, a lawyer called me and said, gee, we're starting a company. would you be interested? He didn't say we're starting a company. He said, do you have any interest? And I said, no. And the reason was I was an academic and my goal was publish papers, advance the state of the art, and so I have no interest in, in that aspect of it. I had moved on to the next thing. Um, when I was at Sandia, I undertook patent licensing. The thing about patent licensing is you gotta be really careful as a business because what I did not get was the right to sue other people. And that's really the underlying problem. The patents were extremely valuable, but other people just did it. They didn't care that I had patents. Um, so I couldn't sue them because the, uh, the patent licensing didn't allow for that. And so that was the end of that. Um, also done digital forensics and investigation. These are tools in widespread use, deception patents um, and so forth. So the deception space is pretty big. It's a multi-billion dollar industry now. I had a couple of the earliest patents. One of them is used uh, for what's called multiple address translation. It's used for AWS and, and all the other uh, major cloud service providers as a method for getting into and out of the back end, as opposed to something like onion routing. And these days we have influence and decider. Uh, influence is a, you know, a defense uh, mechanism or, or a mechanism associated with cybersecurity influence operations and so forth. And there are more of them. So I have some experience at this. Let me see if I can use the right buttons. There we go. <clears throat> at Angel Dags that we help grow companies and we mean we help grow companies. And people mistake this for lots of other things, but we do that the old fashioned way. We earn it, you know, and I'm going to tell you, I can't teach you everything I've learned since the 1970s in a few years. Each of the other people on a team that you're going to need to succeed cannot teach you what they know in a couple of years. And we can't mentor you to get it all done on your own. Um, I don't believe anybody can. So, you know, the challenge here is to, to be successful, you need to mature a company, which means get from startup, you know, to where it emerges, it's in a growth phase, becomes market leading, and then exits. Um, or you could do something else like just licensing it out. Um, that almost never works until the growth stage, because people don't like to license raw technology, because the cost and time and effort associated with turning raw technology into something that's a, a product market fit is what they talk about. And by the way, cybersecurity is not like food or vacations. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna ask you a question. Does anybody here, if you had an option, take a 10 day vacation with your family for say $20,000 or spend $20,000 on cybersecurity, 
Which one would you choose? Who would choose? Oh, let's do some cybersecurity improvement in my small company <clears throat> rather than go on vacation with my family. Well, the answer is nobody ever chose that. All right, maybe a few people, probably I did. <laughs> my family will tell you. Um, so another example of this <clears throat> is bars on the windows. So, you know, nobody has a home with beautiful, you know, picture windows in a nice safe neighborhood and, and says, boy, I really wish I had bars for my windows. That, I would really like that. That's not why you put bars on your windows. You, you don't really want it. Nobody really wants security. They get it because they have to have it. And then just to note at the bottom, religions and companies are scalable. Everything else is not. So, you know, uh, if you're going to affect a change across the world, those are the two ways to do it. And we're talking about companies, not religions in this discussion. If I'm a professor <clears throat> or a graduate student looking at this process, the first question is, what is success? What is your goal? Not my goal, not NSF's goal, not the, the university's goal. What is your goal? You need to understand what you want out of your life. And if it's not business success, good. Enjoy your life at your own expense and time and money. If it's a business success, then it's not about you. It's about the business. And, and that means you need to leave your ego at the door. <clears throat> um, let's talk about what you expect for success in your field. Do your students know as much as you do? I bet nobody here says yes. Are they as good at what you do as you are? I bet nobody here says yes. How long did it take you to get to where you are in terms of your knowledge base? And what did you have to do to get there? So I'm going to tell you that your specialty in context of uh, taking something out to market is like a chief scientist. To succeed, you're going to need somebody at least as good as you are, who's an expert in governance and management. That's going to be the CEO, sales and marketing, IP and special sauce, financial engineering, legal and juridical issues, and the team and technology to support them. And each of these specialties is at least as hard as yours. And you need to recognize that before you try to embark on this process. <clears throat> Here are some of the biggest mistakes. Number one big mistake is if you build a better mousetrap, the world will lead a path to your door. It's just not true. In fact, I'll go a step further. The second best technology almost always wins. <laughs> it's usually about differential benefits. So you have to make enough of a difference between the second best technology and yours to be worth changing. So if it's not quite as good as yours and they get to market first, then it's not worth the time and effort to change for the small improvement you have. Another misimpression is that quality is the key. And I'm just gonna tell you, you know, the key to what door, why do you think McDonald's is so successful, right? Is it because they have the highest quality food? No, <laughs> absolutely not. They have pretty good service usually when they don't spill coffee on you uh, or heat it to too high a temperature, but quality is not the key. It's a competitive world and their customer has to be able to tell the difference in quality in order for it to be a factor in their decision-making process. And the last and most important is that engineers and scientists can sell. They cannot. And it's a disease. We call it the engineer's disease. It's called telling the whole truth. And it's like a disease. Well, first of all, it's impossible to do. There is no whole truth. You can keep on going on forever. And that's where the problem lies. There's such a thing as too much information. <clears throat> so that's what we see all the time out of engineers and scientists trying to sell. Um, so if you look on the right, you see a list of the things you need to do in order to get to where you're commercially successful, if that's the, the practical end of what you're trying to do. And you notice it's a long list and develop a new breakthrough technology might be somewhere on that list. But in fact, without a new breakthrough technology, you could also succeed. So you're competing against all of them as well. Um, by the way, you're also betting your good name on it. I'm gonna cruise through these slides quickly so we can get to q and I've heard this expression. I can't tell you how many people tell me this. They say, all I need is the money to do it. <clears throat> all right, that's the wrong answer, okay? And it's always gonna be the wrong answer because if all you need is money, why don't you have it? And, and when I ask that question, 
the answer is always something and whatever that something is, well, then it's not just money you need. You need that other thing that you needed in order to get the money, <laughs> which is the issue. So when people want to start a business, the first questions I ask are who sells what to whom and how, who does what to fulfill and how do they do that? What does it cost and what's left? And if these answers are okay, then I have lots of other questions, but otherwise we're done. Just not going anywhere else. So what makes the answers okay? Well, the first one is you're able to answer them clearly and simply. And by the way, these slides are available online. You go to all.net, all.net, and you click on the first entry and it has the slides. Um, your answers have to make sense, not to you, but to me <laughs> or your audience. And then what it costs and what's, you know, what's left, that's an, as an investment model. So <clears throat> if I'm putting time, money, effort, whatever into it, I'm only going to do that if at least statistically I can get more out at the end. And by the way, these are technical questions, even though they sound like old business questions, they're technical questions in the technical area of business development, not in your technology area and not in your technical language. So you're gonna to need to know the business language to talk to business people. Okay, so here's something that you probably don't know much about that we do. How will you finance what? So we get this money question all the time. Oh, I need, I need an investor. Turns out, mm, Almost everything you want to do can be done without investment money. Owners fund things, employees, there are loans, notes, factoring, equity, um, you know, trade uh, funds, credit, um, customer funded things, grants, uh, donations, crowdfunding, public, uh, going public and other things. And likely what you need is a mix, which means you have to engineer that mix and you have to figure out why it is to do it this way or that way or the other way. So that's financial engineering. And on the right, you see a list of financial risks. This is just the financial risks that you usually need to, you know, have an answer for each of these in terms of the percentage impact on the company um, if that happens, right? And you need the facts and evidence to support it and the assumptions behind it. Gee, it almost sounds like science, doesn't it? And by the way, money is that fuel that keeps the engine going. So if it comes to investors, who's going to invest? Why are they going to invest? When are they going to, what are they going to invest? It's different for each of these different sources of investment funds. And as you can see, there are a bunch of those and they each have, you know, different time frames that they invest in, how much they invest, how often they invest, the process they use to decide, the rules they put in place for the deal terms, the way they make decisions, the things they invest in and so forth. And everyone has to be sold individual except maybe crowdfunding. And by the way, the golden rule is who has the gold makes the rule. And I just wanna note, you can't get $10 million from a pauper. So depending on how much you need, you need to figure out who to go to and you need to create a sales sieve to sell to investors just as you create a sales sieve to sell to customers. And if you don't know what that is or what that means, then you probably need somebody that does that. <laughs> um, what do they look for? They each buy for a reason. Generally speaking, investors want more money out than they put in, but it's a combination of emotion and reason. And it balances different things differently for different investors. They're usually investing in the jockey and the team. That's the CEO and the team, and that's because of trust. The risk and reward, that's the deal. The ability to reach a big market, to fulfill the promises, um, for barriers uh, to entry and stickiness or barriers to exit. They want to look at the financial plan and engineering, make sure you're competent at it and you're not wasting their money. The legal issues, that's a risk management issue and the match between them and you, because frankly, you know, they own the company, which means they own the rights to the technology, which means they own the cost and the risks associated with all the people and everything else in the company. An investor is an owner. You know, when they, when they give you their money, they own the company just as you own the company. And they're making a bet, and the bet has to make sense to them. So the question is, how do they see the bet? And what you see on the right here is the second race to, at Santa Anita. This is the bet sheet, right? This is, when you go to the races, you get a sheet, and it looks like this. 
what has to go right, what could go wrong, what are the assumptions, what facts and evidence support it. It's just like betting on a horse, they're betting on a company. If they're putting more than $2 in, probably they need more information in order to make that decision. <clears throat> diligence is also required. They're gonna go through a due diligence process and that means they're gonna ask a whole lot of questions and you have to be willing to answer them. Um, an example on the left is a great team playing well together, very experienced you know, CEO running the companies with a solid team and a great eye and so forth. You can read what the list says if you can read it, small print. On the right, we have a fantastic opportunity with a compelling story from the CEO and a great idea with great connections until you drill down into diligence. Then you find out that the team are, they're real people, but most of them are not as good as they're portrayed and not are actually engaged in the company. They're just names. And they've sort of agreed notionally that we'll do that someday, maybe. Um, the CEO is exaggerated, okay? Almost everything, almost always that the CEO says is exaggerated. 